Uh, wonderful. Hi everyone. This is I'm Catherine from Subpod, um, and I have invited our wonderful chef uh, Jordan Seneford from Crystal Brook uh, Resort in Byron Bay to um, to come along and just share a little bit about the Subpod journey uh, out at the resort there, and um, and hopefully to provide some information uh, to some people who also might want to start um, composting on a larger scale um in uh, in restaurants and resorts schools or commercial businesses that have food waste so uh yeah welcome jordan and um love you to do a little intro uh if you want i'm also just letting you know i've got the little video uh that we made of you and uh, the team when we installed subpod so if there's ever a little moment you want to show that i've got that ready to go so um yeah welcome yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me here, and hello everyone else. I um I can only see Catherine at the minute, so um yeah, I like your shirt, Catherine. It looks great. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I've been the executive chef here at the Crystal Brook Byron and the Forest Restaurant for nearly two years, and and part of coming on board is is their um, motto of responsible luxury and. And sustainability practices in the resort, and one of the one of the many things we we're doing is um, our old operations manager got in touch with Subpod or Catherine or however it worked out that we ended up working with Subpod, and we got uh, these beautiful Subpods and worms join our our fa family here in our regenerated rainforest, and um, we've been directing our green waste there ever since, and. And the program's growing, and we're we're looking forward to doing even more with that in sort of 2023. So it's been it's been a good process. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And you, and last time I think I spoke to you, you said you were processing about 120 liters of food waste a week um, with the subpods that you've got. Is that still about the right amount of volume? Yeah. Look, I um one one thing that did happen recently is uh, we put in a, a garden bed to hopefully start growing produce here. And we've moved some of the, like the way it happened, they moved some of the soil out and then sort of disrupted some of the worms in there, which means they've, they've moved into this new garden and so they're doing their work there. But um, a couple of the subpods where that happened, they sort of slowed down a bit. But actually the amount of waste we were putting, green waste we were putting in there before, we probably could have put more. Um, so we're still able to go through that 120 litre volume and, mm -hmm. you know, at full capacity, it could even be more. Uh, there's a few things that the subpod worms don't actually like to eat. So we've also got compost um, bins here at the resort that we direct things like uh, citrus and chilli, anything that accidentally gets something like that in, it's kind of contaminated for the worms, I guess or we could sort sort through it, but we just put that in our compost bin. So we at the moment, we're able to divert sort of 100% of our green waste at the right. resort. And, and a lot, the majority of that is through the sub pods. So when you're talking about you know, citrus and chilli, are you talking about like whole bucket loads of that? Or are you talking like just a bit here and there? Well, to be honest, it's probably a bit here and there. And then like onions as well, for example, this is an interesting thing about the worms is they don't want to have the raw onion, but apparently you can roast them and, and it's like their favourite thing to eat. But we just haven't got, got that far yet in our journey, but it's not to say that we won't. Um, well, interestingly enough, like Andrew, he did a little experiment because Subpod can take citrus and onions. It's just, as I said, you would, um, you'd want to like have it mixed in with other things, particularly where your subpods are at right now. Like maybe at the beginning, you know, when you're first, first starting off, it was probably, you know, they're a little delicate and getting used to the, building their populations up. But I know that Andrew did an experiment when he went to the local pie factory and he got whole, he got like, I think it was one ton of onion skins and he fed them to his worms. And what happened is they actually went out into the soil for the first day or two and then they came in and they gorged on them because you know how onions, as you said, when they get roasted, they go sweet. So yeah, okay. it's all more to do with just allowing worms not to be trapped in a space 
where if there is any oils or, or gas coming off, they call it off gassing, particularly with the citruses, that, you know, they've got somewhere they can escape to. And of course, you know, subpod worms are free range, so they can head off into the garden if they don't like something and come back. So I'd be really interested to see, you know, if you could, if you want to do a little trial and just see, you know, how your worms handle it. I know your populations at one stage were booming, that they were just, there was worms everywhere. And, and when they get to that stage, you know, they're pretty robust and the, the relationship with the microbes, of course, um, it helps them, you know, the microbes get in there and start to break up those, those things like onions and citrus and chili, uh, and then the worms come behind them and like, you know, gorge on the microbes. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, it'd be really interesting to see that. But look, your volume of waste, so you're not throwing any green green food waste out, out, of, out from the kitchens at this time? Look, I, I could probably say that some makes it into our bins. You know, if we're under the palm for, yeah. you know, late in the day and the buckets have been collected already. So to say 100% is probably, like, would, could cause me issues if I did, but it's yeah, definitely yeah, yeah. going to be going to be somewhere up above 90 percent so we're through the day when we're prepping and our breakfast chefs start the process put the buckets out and our prep chefs use it yeah we're diverting it all in there and then we've even got um like a, a prep chef come purchase officer he even like chops it all up chops up all the cauliflower stems and the avocado seeds and stuff breaks it down into nice sizes for the worm so that in itself is a bit of a luxury but yeah, that's you know, awesome. The whole thing's been a bit of a learning curve yeah. for us and a, and a good one as well. So I think yeah. another thing was at the the stage where you came out maybe once one or two visits ago and the worms were really going off, but they were starting to be affected by, um, I think you sort of called it an aerobic or something like that. It was starting, the, the soil was starting to get a bit um, sticky. Yeah. And that was like, we, were, we weren't putting enough carbon in. So it's just like all these different, you know, almost learn something every time there's a visit from yeah. Catherine or somebody. And, and, you know, like you really see it when they're at optimal, they're just thriving and there's so many worms. Yeah. So look, that's the thing too, is like, you know, I try to um, help people understand that, you know, think of forest floor, think of, in, you know, think of leaves, worms, fallen fruit, there's browns, there's greens, there's, you know, all of those things. And you want to keep it light, fluffy. You want to keep it so the worms and the microbes can get in amongst it. So that's probably what I see most happening, is particularly in schools where they have like large volumes of, say, fruit and bread and, and, and larger pieces of food waste. You know, those tips of, A, chopping it up as small as you can, making sure that you've got enough carbon in there and that you're aerating every time, you know, basically using that, that's that, aerator tool to really fluff up and, and allow that air flow through the waste really helps to speed up um, the amount of food waste and uh, and the volumes that you can go through. And so look, but one of the things that I often get asked is like, what is your routine? What is the process? You know, like the sub pods itself, you know, we've got lots of information about how to feed them and how to add more carbon and aerate and how to harvest. But a lot of people want to know, you know, what do you, how do you set it up so that you have a routine in your business, in your kitchen? Look, what's the, the flow through from, you know, the waste on the chopping board through to feeding the worms? Look, you know, I'd love to hear a bit more about how yeah. that works in your, in your setup. Yeah, so look, our, our setup's quite, specific because we, we're like a 45 acre regenerated rainforest in Byron Bay and and um you know like even our room service here we've got to put it on carts take it to the guest rooms whereas in a lot of other resorts they might have a a, a lift in the center so the worms are sort of halfway down the back of the property um so we had to create sort of our own system and you know my, my personal philosophy is like if you can set something up to be more automatic or automated it's going to have a higher chance of working so although we're not at the pinnacle growing our food gardens the whole feeding of the worms happens pretty systematically so we we set up buckets in the key areas for prep in the kitchen and then we collect the waste there and then basically at two periods of the day, so it's not sitting out all day, it goes into the big um, butcher's tubs. So they hold they hold about 40 litres. 
of waste. And then they start to get a bit out of hand through the week and there's a day of the week and it's usually on the Friday before the weekend where our breakfast chef, it's either our breakfast chef and her offsider or our purchasing supervisor come prep chef. So two people, they'll get it, they'll break down, like cut down any of the big bits, sort out anything that shouldn't be in there, whether like a rubber band or plastic got in there and they'll basically like set up the buckets, load up our golf buggies and they'll drive them down there. And then we've got a garden shed on location with the sub pods, which houses our sawdust or our coconut husk or what we're using as the carbon. Often they'll, we, we try and be fairly paperless, but people still print here. So they'll um, go and collect from any, any paper deposits and shred the paper and take that down too. So they kind of have a little bit of a sort of collection and a, a second processing of everything to load the cart and then drive it down. And, and, you know, they take it down there and they turn it into the um, worm farms and they might collect some herbs or whatever. And that's sort of like one, at least one day a week. It probably ends up being about three days a fortnight that they do it. Um, but it's, yeah, it means the cold rooms aren't ever too full of any, any um, big buckets of waste too long. The worms are getting fed and giving them a long enough time to process down what we feed them. And, you know, it's not too much labour hours because it's efficient. That system sort of is efficient. People can get their prep done at the time. They're not chopping down the little tiny pieces at that time. That's factored into this sort of hour, hour and a half of, of, of these people going and feeding the worms once a week. So that works for us. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and look, you know, the importance of, you know, realising, you know, that it's not just like a rubbish bin where you just, you know, open the lid, throw something, in, close the lid and walk away. You know, any form of composting, if you're going to do it right, it needs to have, like a garden, you know, it needs a certain amount of attention or it needs someone to be, you know, the champion that's going to go there and make sure that the right amount of carbon, that it's aerated, you know, that the garden itself is getting watered as well. So, you know, that's one of the, the biggest things about, you know, I try to encourage people to think about either a green team, you know, or you've got somebody that that's their job role. It's part of, you know, their roster. It's part of what they do. And for them to see that as, as a really positive thing and also to try and encourage employ, employers to see that the role of, you know, uh, paying someone, uh, to go and look after their compost and to to grow things that they could possibly be used in the kitchen is, is such a valuable thing as well. So it, it's slowly starting to change, you know, the attitude of people um, rather than just like, oh, let me just dispose of this waste. I don't want to have to think about it. It's shifting to like seeing it more as a, a, a resource or something that you can actually turn into something that's of value. So uh, I know that your your dream is to to be able to grow a lot more for the kitchen. So so yeah, jo, I know I've been down there, and of course you know I went I popped down there uh, recently, and there was a fabulous big one bed of mint, and then there was huge big chili bush and and volunteer pumpkins and tomato plants coming out of of the compost next to the <laughs> next to the sub pods. But what are some of the things that you you hope to to get installed? I know you've got a new whole garden bed that you're about to set up. What kind of things are you you looking at at uh, wanting to grow for the kitchen? Well, you know, I, I guess we ha we have to work with the seasons, but it's kind of more. There might be sort of thirty percent allocated to growing something specifically for a dish for a season, whether that's a radish or tomatoes. But I do feel like um, a, a lot of it will end up being kind of herbs and flowers and garnish type things. We've got one one bed allocated to growing even sea herbs, but I do want to get some natives in there, some finger limes, um, and 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 things that will sort of be around for a longer time. So again to sort of automating the system it's like we can use herbs every day they tend to flourish you, tr you prune them they will you know sort of be be something that we can we can stay on top of in in this sort of process that we have set yeah look this is i just thought i'd, I'd bring up a picture of the oh, can you still hear me yeah, yeah, you went, um, you went unmuted, you went muted there for a moment, but somebody was trying to call. 
<laughs> but they, they basically have enough of it set up that's going to be sort of cyclable through the seasons, things that can make it on the menu on the regular, and then some things like like I was saying, like about 30% where we can target um, produce that we want to grow for a specific menu for a season and try our luck. We might be successful with some things and less successful with others. You know, it would be great when it's tomato season around here, sort of I was hoping this year, but because of all the like scrub turkeys and things that jumped in, um, tomatoes, you know, beautiful, fresh, homegrown tomatoes. So I've got some growing at my house and there's nothing better. Um, and they, not, they might not be able to feature on our menu as a permanent side of tomatoes, but it might be in a special for that night because, yeah. you know, of the volume. But it's also just beautiful to be able that, to offer that to our guests, um, to eat things out of the garden, to have it as a part of an experience in a tour and it's fun for us and the chefs to, to get to do it as well. Like, you know, I said it's generally our breakfast chef and one other ring in for feeding the worms. If it's a little bit quiet, that could be our pastry chef or could be someone who's new to the team. And it's just, you know, it's fun for them to do that little trip, to hop in the buggy, to go down, to feed the worms and to understand a little bit more about um sort of our sustainability practices and, and what, what our scope and what we're trying to do here. So it's a little bit of fun. I, I do see a lot of places have them just out the front of their cafe though and things like that work really well because, you know, they, there's less of a distance to travel to feeding the worms. So in that case, you, your whole system for getting it done will be different again. Um, we're sort of blessed a little bit that we've got the carts and we've got the – the, the buy-in from the team that want to do it. Yeah. But again, it's always a learning for us. And Catherine's been super good with uh, even say our scrub turkey problem the other day, her suggestion was putting in some bamboo stakes that will sort of deter them from landing on the garden and little easy fixes like that. And all of this stuff is is fun to learn and do and, and then see the result, I guess. Yeah. And look, it's just, again, the story you know, even if you can just inspire someone to understand the relationship between food waste, growing food, eating incredible food that's been grown in really great soil, you know, helping people to experience a moment of that, like, as you said, a tomato that's been grown, you know, from the garden, um, and to start to think about, you know, their the relationship to food, to soil, to waste, um, and that's a lot of, that I see in schools, like I get teachers that go, you know, we've got so much waste, how am I going to do it all? And I'm like, Look, just start small, you know, start some with a project that you can, you can really manage to maintain. And that's why I said to you guys, you know, start with seven, which is I've just put the picture on the screen. You've got one for each day of the week, which, you know, that was just a starting point. Of course, you've adjusted your, your schedule to be, you know, once a week because that's what works for you. You know, there is no have to's, you know, it's just, um, it's learning to work. You're working with a natural system and you've got to work in with the human beings as well as part of that natural system. So again, it's about working out dynamics and relationships that are going to work in each situation. And that's what we like, what I, I'm always wanting to do. And the reason why I've got people like you and the Unilever chefs joining us to share their experiences and to share, you know, how it works for them, how it doesn't work for them, what kind of things would help, um, because we ultimately want to help people to do this on whatever level, whatever scale. So it's just so valuable to have you just down the road to be able to come and go, okay, so what do we need to what what do we need to solve now? You know, bush turkeys. And of course, this is the beautiful shot I'm showing you here of the, when it was, you know, originally set up. And then, you know, as you said, then um, can you see this one now with the little covers on them? Uh, you had the not just the bush turkeys, but you had the wallabies. So of course, there's little kangaroos that went, oh, that's a really tasty lettuce. Let me, um, <laughs> you know, let me, um, let us, let me, you know, see what that one tastes like. And we came back, you know, a couple of weeks later, and and every single. Um, let me see here, every single plant that we planted had been nibbled away by the wallabies. So, and of course, different parts of the world, you're going to have different things. So, of course, this was the lovely, your gardeners, I think it was, or your grounds people uh, put up this, these lovely little structures over the top um, to prevent that wildlife from getting in, particularly as you can see, it's it's got all that bushland behind it. So, 
aren't really what is sort of in, a, in an area where there's not much human visiting in between, you know, the visits to the sheds and things like that. And then I just wanted to share, this is your new bed, um, just so that people can get an idea of, I've just got to find uh, how I get onto this one. Uh, this one here. Okay, this is your new garden beds. Can you see that there? The wooden ones. So this is where John is hoping to to grow some more of the specialty items. I know you were saying like you know things like finger limes and some of the sea herbs. Like around here, there's a lot of uh, natural. Um, what do they call it? Sea. Sea succulents. Yeah, sea succulents that he are starting to use. So again, you're starting to educate people about some of the native bush foods or the, the, what would occur naturally in this environment is another story or another great aspect of uh, showing people, you know, how to connect in with um, the food that's around them or the natural environment. And um, yeah, that's always one of my great passions. It's not just about you know, here, have a sub pod, put your waste in it. And let's look at, you know, what more it brings to you and your story. So, so I just wanted to show, show those little images. And, and then the, the, I just want to open it up now to, the, we've got a couple of guests here, Rhonda and Aya. And um, I know for Lizzie, who's just joined the sub pod team, she's learning as well. Um, if any of you have any questions, um, feel free to raise your hand or unmute and um, let's get the conversation going. If you've got questions or if you're too shy, you can pop one in the chat. Um, but yeah, I'd love to have a have see what it is that you guys would like to hear about. I, mean, I can see Aya here saying it is about being part of the big cycle. Yeah, food, soil, waste. Yeah, totally. And that's really about yeah, we, sometimes, you know, at Subpod, someone gets inspired to just start composting and then if it can lead on to them thinking about their foods, then it starts to lead on to their health, you know, how nutritious their food can become. So anyway, enough from me. <laughs> Has anybody got a question for uh, Jordan? Um, or would you like us to hear to speak about anything else that you might be interested in hearing? Oh, Rhonda, great. Hi, Rhonda. Hi. Um, well, I'm not shy, but I, I guess I don't really have too many questions. I just wanted to see what large scale looked like. Yeah. And I had the question about the citrus and the chili and all that, but you already addressed that, Catherine. Um, because I too have been putting I've been putting a little in with mine, um, not a lot. I think not a lot of any one thing isn't good, including like tomatoes and try to keep it a decent mix. Um, but there have been times where I'm just I'm heavy on citrus, you know, a bag of oranges went moldy or something. And I, I had read that that was off putting. So I didn't put it in. But um, I think you've already kind of addressed that a little bit. So I've learned about that. I did not know what a sea succulent was. And so I was going to ask you, but I Googled it. So I'm reading all about that. And so I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. That's where I live, where I'm calling from. And, um, you know, some of our some of our soil is quite salty in this great lake basin that we live in. And I'm wondering if I could perhaps grow a sea succulent. So I'm, yeah. I'm just, <laughs> just researching that because that sounds awesome. Well, well that, um, that's what you, you have to do with with one of those sort of separate gardens is it's like you got to, well, I would have yeah. to water it with a salinated solution, like very, very minimal, but then you get like a little crunchy, sweet sea salt spray. But if you've got salinated soil already, could be, little, could be something to look into. Yeah, I'm curious now because if you, you know, with, with a traditional compost pile, those, the salts from just all of the animal manures that I put into my compost, because I have, I have a lot of vegetarian pets, you know, a pot-bellied pig and chickens and ducks. And um, I'm thinking, I wonder if, like, I've killed things with um, just my compost pile, uh, just too, too many salts in the soil, oh. like, you know, traditional vegetables won't grow there but perhaps I can grow sea succulents so I'm gonna I'm gonna experiment with that so um, 
Thank and, you for that. And what about asparagus is another one that loves a bit of salt. I know that oh. there's, some, there's some some places where they actually pour salt water onto them. Again, um, I think know. asparagus is another one that likes salt. And there was things like kale, of course, you know, things that we, they used to grow by the ocean. So you okay. can definitely, yeah. There's, it's there's, got my wheels spinning. I, yeah. I, hadn't thought, I hadn't thought of that. And I'm also interested to hear about this, the animal manure and the salts. That's an interesting one. I'm going to have to check with our uh, uh, Peter Howard, our science man, about that one because I've not heard that before. That's really interesting. That's what we were taught in the Master Gardener course, um, yeah. that to really age that compost before applying it to your to your beds. Oh, and, is, that, is that like a traditional compost pile or is it through right. the vermicod? Yeah, okay, so vermicod. Like a traditional where you're just, yeah. you know, it's going right into the soil or just, yeah. Um, yeah, traditional where folks wouldn't compost long enough to get those yeah. salts to leach through in their in their bin and then apply it to the vegetable gardens too soon and that that could be a problem and you can imagine you know in, in a, the second most arid state in the united states we're not getting enough rainfall to drive that through the soil so it can kind of build up so yeah, yeah. Great. an experiment yeah and um, so, look, getting back to that citrus thing, like, uh, you know, when you talked about having a whole bag of oranges, you know, the other thing, too, that I've heard, uh, like Peter Howard share about our uh, science, Dr. Compost, is, um, again, chopping, you know, wouldn't put a whole orange in there because it's just going to take so long. I mean, of course, you can chop things up and yeah. then let them sort of even just leave them out from, you know, a day or something somewhere to allow the oils to evaporate and then put them in. You can okay. put them to the worm farms. And again, adding enough carbon, adding enough, you know, aerating and a lot of, and a variety of foods. So you would just wouldn't, you know, but look, I got, I met this wonderful woman, Mindy, who's a huge worm composting fan. And she has really large systems that she processes. Like in the US, I know they have school meals, you know, they, they provide them with lunches. And they end up with huge, massive amounts of food waste. And she's got these really big setups. And she's like, she's such a fan. She goes, you can throw anything at them. You can throw anything at those worms. They will get through it. And again, it was just that she had such a robust population. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens is when your population is like just thriving, you can throw anything in. They kind of like become like this voracious <laughs> beast mm -hmm. that will eat everything you throw in there like i know peter's thrown in roadkill you know he's put in like a dead possum and he's you know a week later it's it's gone you know except for the bones of course but in one you know, traditional classic sized tub pod, yeah yeah wow yeah but you know he buried it beneath you know the bedding he made sure, sure it was in amongst right in the yeah. middle um yeah. and then you know put lots of carbon around it and you know really just wow um, and the population and it, and it you know it took i mean the fur and the i think the fur and the the but bones disgusting <laughs> but wow yeah, I, really, I think his next amazing. goal is to is to compost a wombat he's now moved down to tasmania oh, and he's hoping to not hoping to come across a dead wombat <laughs> but <laughs> I think it's on his it's on his wish list to, to, to really see how long it would take to compost a wombat. But anyway, but look, George, no, sorry, we're, we're digressing here. Um, I know you. I appreciate you're... all of that citrus, though, because um, something you don't have to deal with, Jordan, is the the temperature situation that I have. So I took out a, a great portion of my worms, and I have them in a setup, a different kind of setup in my somewhat heated garage, and so. They're only at like 55 degrees, so they're not, they're, they're very much alive, but they're not going to be as robust. So that would not be the time to throw them, you know, too much crazy stuff. But once I get them back outside in the spring, then um, I will make sure that I don't shy away from those, those foods we talked about. Yeah, yeah. Interesting though, even like your, your work around that you, they sort of have to hibernate for a season. So the temperature gets, you know. I'm actually going to put, yeah, a seed. A, well, I can only keep my garage at like 50, 55 because I'm hibernating, truly hibernating my desert tortoise in there. And so he can't be any warmer than that. 
but I'm gonna put a seed starting mat underneath them and elevate that temperature a little bit and play with it and see just how robust I can get them this winter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The seed, the seed well, study the mats have seemed to be very popular. I also want to find someone who's willing to try the hot water bottles. <laughs> To put a hot water bottle on top of the worm blankets or you know around you know and create a little insulation <laughs> that I was you know what i'm gonna them. try that for okay. the garage um it, it was it was way too much for outside because i don't think it would be enough to keep them in the ground outside with a hot water bottle but in my garage i thank you for reminding me of that because it's way more energy efficient i, yeah. I would prefer to try that first so i'm gonna do that <laughs> Oh, great. Well, what, send me a little message through the I'll ground and how it works. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and Catherine, let me know how, how it goes as well. Yeah. Well, see, because well, we suggest in summertime when it gets really hot to freeze water bottles um, and then you can put them in uh, into the, you can actually bury them right down into the middle of, and all the worms will, if it's too cold, they'll run away and they'll come closer. So it's kind of like this internal air conditioning unit in the middle of the sub pod that you can, do for hot for hot climates um so and that's one of the great things that we've got happening on the grow hub is people sharing you know hey here's a picture of my sub pond a six foot of snow and and like snow is an insulator and they're like and the amount of food waste that's in there being composted is it generating enough heat to keep the worms happy and the snow is creating insulation um, with a little greenhouse structure and things like that around it so all these little tips and tricks are really great for trying to keep the worms happy and as i said they do generate enough of their own heat at a certain level and again it's it is it's about learning how to work with the natural processes and and, uh, and getting a little creative of course um, with the yeah, I'm doing that outside as well with the dry leaves. To put, I pumped a whole bunch of dry leaves in there to help with that um, insulation and heat generation. But I just, I didn't want to leave them all out there. I know that no. would be better, but I was just, I was, it's kind of like, you know, cutting Edging my losses eggs. a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to preserve, for sure, preserve some of them, even though I know they'll yeah. be egg in the spring and they'll come back. But yeah, so I'm, I like the experimental part of this. Oh, great. So great to hear. Great. And Aya, did you have any questions for, for Jordan? Yeah, um, I, I'm more interested in how you um, involve all your team members in this process, because you cannot do it, you know, the large scale like you do alone. So you would need a whole team working with you. Yeah, how well, do, you do that. Well, it, it, to be fair, the way it sort of happened was natural selection. The people that were most interested and got behind it, I saw that they were getting behind it and I sort of then pulled them aside and had a conversation and sort of worked out how it could work into their workflow better. And so now they're just, it's pretty informal, but it just happens like clockwork that they, they do this. Um, but for new people coming, I understand like what you're saying is it's it, it might I might have been lucky. So with new people that I'm interviewing for the role, it's one of my questions is sort of what their thoughts and their experience working with like with anything s sustainability is, and sort of find out like a guy I just hired um, for a purchasing supervisor role. Uh, he's been doing sort of pick up Australia Day, which is like picking up waste and discarded things off beaches it happens once a year. And he was very interested by, by our company because of that. And when I told him that um, he could support doing some of these things that we've got, like uh, we have flow hive beehives and we've got the sub pod worm farms and it can add diversity to the role. Um, he was really excited to do that. And so if you're going to onboard people knowing that they may have to do some part of that, then I guess you can sort of train them, show them how, allocate the time to, to do it. I think that's probably a big bit of it is because if I need people to help me do it, I also need to give them the time and the space to get it done. Um, the Probably the people I've had the most trouble with is like the gardeners. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which is funny, but I think the chefs are glad to get out of the kitchen and have a breath of fresh air and go drive a buggy and play with worms and whatnot. Um, but 
sometimes like the garden is it's it's a regenerating like it's kind of like a swamp being regenerated into a rainforest and it's a big job there's always stuff that they're doing so i think that might be there's sort of too few of them and this this is sort of extra work for them and that's the big work around with getting this garden up and running is um getting enough people to support me to help get this job done. And then we'll, we, once it's up and running, I think my team can sort of handle maintaining it to a degree. Mm -hmm. And then Catherine will come and kick us in the butt uh, <laughs> when we're not doing it right anyway. And hopefully we, we learn something can improve, you know, so that's part oh. of it as well. But look, yeah, look, that's some great points there. Like, you know, initially, because Monique was the one who, who reached out to us, you know, and so I think part of the policy of Crystal Brook was to be responsible luxury is one of the things that they talk about and reducing their carbon footprint and sustainability is part of their business It's part of, yeah, what they have, what they stand for as a business. And so it, I get phone calls quite often from businesses and schools going, I've been made a sustainability officer. What does that mean? What do I do? You know, so we really are at the very beginning of businesses having to come on board with these kind of practices. So again, it's, it's, this is where collaboration and sharing of knowledge and experience is so valuable because we're all walking this journey together and every situation is so unique that you do. And I say to people, the first thing you need is, you know, you can try doing it on your own. And it's wonderful that you've got the time to do that and, and, the, and the resources. But it's going to be so much more sustainable if you've got a team. And, and some of the things that the long term garden school composting project people have shared with me, because I'm always asking them this question is, you, you go to the cleaners, because they said again, the cleaners and the gardeners, <laughs> are often the hardest ones to get on board because they're given so much work to do that you're adding something else to their job list. So that's why they're like, oh my God, you know, really you want me to start doing this? But the they say, instead of tell, asking them to do it, it's like, well, what would you like to see happening with the food waste here? And sort of get them to start thinking about, well, actually, what do I want to see happening with this? Do I want to see some really positive things happening with this? Or do I just want to, I don't want to know about it, you know? So you're starting here, a lot of the time you're starting to introduce these ideas. And one of the long-term schools that we've got, they've seen how amazing the plants that grow around the subpods. And they're like, um, wait a minute, uh, I've got my roses over there. I want them to do the same thing. So actually, you know, maybe we can put some around the roses. You know? <laughs> so again, um, it's having, you know, and I call it the subpod champion. Like we've got Jordan, he's awesome. At one of the schools, we've got Tracy at Lindisfarne. They've got 42 subpods that she has to look after. And she's, you know, again, not struggling, but she has to really convince the principal and the other teachers to like go, guys, this is such a valuable thing to do. Can you support me in this? Can you, you know, like, can we allocate some time or resources to continuing this project? And, um, and you know, she, she, it'll sometimes it'll be yes, and then sometimes it'll slow down. And I say to her, look, you know, if you find it, it's too overwhelming, just reduce the number of subpods. And even if you're just doing it, um, you're doing a small amount, you're still demonstrating to everyone that's around and to the students and to continuing generations, this is what can be possible to do. And even if you're inspiring one child to go home or to their parents or they grow up and they think back to what used to happen at school, that's one more person doing something responsible and doing something good with food waste. It's inspired. So I know we all want everyone to come on board and it all to be miraculously happening. But, you know, the reality of you, you're basically herding human beings. It's, you know, they're harder to herd than cats. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm always looking for you know, feedback or suggestions from people about how they made it work. And some of the some of the schools say rewards. And I say in schools, how? Food. You know, if you can grow, if you can show people that they can eat something that's been grown from somewhere, then, you know, they, you know, pe people love to be rewarded. And as Jordan was saying, to have a special heirloom tomato that's been grown in this awesome composting soil and to have a little tour of you know
um, that have uh, run around the caravan park and they collect all the food and then they all go to feed the worms and it's become part of this feature of this caravan park is you know getting the kids doing little tours little adventures um allowing people to pick the herbs by the barbecue area you know so there's this reward system sometimes also is another a great way of engaging people um and yeah and just finding those sustainable people like as jordan says you employ people that that's part of how they live how they think or how they would like to live and think hope that helps <laughs> oh look it's so awesome look jordan I've, i don't know if you've um uh you are uh, you're gonna have to pop down we, we were planning to try and get you to pop down to the sub pods and and show them all do, the... do you want me to go for a stroll yeah, well, I don't know if you've got time and if these lovelies want to want to wait for you to go and have a look. I'd love, particularly like you to open the very first one on the right when you get down yeah. there. So I'm just going to pause is the recording. Everyone, is everyone happy to hang on the line? Yeah, great. I'm just going to pause the recording though, so you know you're going to get in the go. This is the golf buggy. Should I'm not, show I'm you the not journey down. The Which one did you want to see? Yeah, so the, just to show them, you can see that he, this is him not having done anything with the gardens. <laughs> this is all kind of like the things that have survived. Um, so that's, that's just mint and tomatoes in there. Here's oregano. A whole lot of that. That makes its way into our chimichurri sauce. And there's more of that here. And then some big chilies. It's a big jungle of them in there. Yeah, they're ready to pop. Yeah, hopefully more mint. That makes its way into the uh, caparinas and the um, mojitos. At the bar. <laughs> Got a and few then... little tomatoes here. Here's yeah. a couple of little, little ones. Right. And then the sub pot on the other yeah, end, I want you to going. open it. Oh, look at that, little tomatoes. So the very first one on the right near the shed. This one? Yeah. See, you, Courtney, put, so you can see Courtney, all the volunteer put, pumpkins. Courtney's and... put some gem heart cos in here and it's starting to regrow as well. You just cut right. the stem, stem so off. So just open up the lid. Oh, there you go. There's a little present for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I got you a hurry, hurry. I don't know if you wear a hat, but look, there's a hat for you down visiting the worms. <laughs> yeah, of course I do. <laughs> Sun there, say. There you go. There's the, the worm feeding hat. Oh, that's a very nice. Is it? Is this like a little digger? Yeah, so if you take it out, it's a it's awesome tool. When you used to get your plants, I'm going to help Jordan get some plants and show you how to plant things. But yeah, it's you take it out. It's a it's a digger, it's a knife, and a sort of a saw, and um, it's one of the Japanese traditional gardening tools. That's that uh, yeah, a lot of gardeners really enjoy. So, um, whoop. Hurry, hurry is your favourite. Yes, Rhonda. Yeah, I love it too. It's um, it's one of those gardening tools. Not that Jordan's the big gardener, but we're going to inspire him too. And and uh, hey, yeah. my gardens at home are going off with tomatoes and basil oh, okay. and all sorts of good. It's a bit trickier down here. Yeah. To get this one going, but look at that. There's some healthy pasta going on in here. Yeah. We just need to pop into the local nursery. We'll just go shopping and we'll plant some and we'll get some mulch on that soil. That's the other thing that, you know, the mulch, allowing the worms to adventure out into the garden is always a great well, thing. Well, well, there are a lot of tomatoes here, so they don't seem to be getting hassled. So we probably will end up being able to do put them on yeah. a dish. Great. But yeah, lo lots, of, lots of work to be done. But thank you. At least Yay. now I'm going to hurry, hurry to to do it with. 
<laughs> hurry, hurry. Yep. You have to take oh, it out and look at it. It's a really great tool. Rhonda's obviously a fan. A, I don't know if you've you've used one before, but they're really, you know, they're, they're way better than a trowel. Um, so they're great for like when you're going to replant. They've got the saw, so if you need to cut anything off, um, I'm trying to do that, um, not pulling things out anymore, but chopping them off. So the chop and drop rather than pulling the plants out, um, simply because all those lovely roots have created all these great, not only water and air channels, but also the bacteria and fungi that they have living with them. Um, we want to try and keep them in the soil. So that's something that I'm I'm new to learning, but yeah, the hori hori is great for just chopping it off at the top <laughs> and yeah, feeding well, the rest to the worms. So. But well, look- There you go, even even you're still learning. So, you know, that, yeah. that's part of the, the fun of this process, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's why I, I continue wanting to get people like yourself um antonio and uh leonardo from unilever again two other passionate chefs and they're very fortunate to work for a company that it's again part of their policy and they've even got the machinery they've got like an industrial mulcher so they put all of their cardboard boxes that they get their food delivered in they get that put through an industrial mulching machine and it shreds up and that becomes part of their carbon source so that might be the next thing jordan you need to <laughs> on your wish list uh, to see whether you can get some of that cardboard, you know, shredded uh, to feed the worms, yeah. the carbon, and and uh, again, it's another great uh, okay. like a cardboard great... shredder. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. So I'll I'll come down and start hassling uh, <laughs> hassling you guys again soon. It's always great to have an excuse to get away from the computer screen. Um, and of course, it's such a beautiful property there. I don't know uh, if uh, where you are, are yeah, but uh, yeah, are you in Darwin? Are you? Yeah. Uh, actually, oh wow, you're up in Darwin. Wow. So I've got a problem with the heat. Yeah. <laughs> My worms, they're dying. So oh, I thought I might that. try the sub pod now. Yeah. yeah. The ice block. So look, the other thing too is maybe we you know when you're planting in a garden bed, make sure that the at the front as well there's enough insulation between the side of the garden bed. So there's like basically a good amount of soil all the way around. Mm -hmm. I was composting up at 42 degree heats up at Woodford for a week and managed to keep the worms cool. They were right down the very bottom, like you know, hiding it like this. But it was still cool in there. Um, worm blankets kept damp and again you know I even had people who have thrown wet towels you know those you know in the heat of the day if it's getting sun those reflective windscreen <laughs> things right putting things like that over the top again the frozen water bottles yeah. I, you know I've got a friend who has a beach umbrella in, embedded into their um the base of a beach umbrella embedded into the garden bed so they can pop the brolly up uh, again, in the heat of the day to keep the heat from directly on top of the sub pod lid. But yeah, you'll have a lot more. Um, yeah, just thinking about the heat of the summer that they're not out sitting out in the sun for 12 hours a day or eight hours a day. I've got nice uh, hibiscus branches sort of covering over, but their roots are very killing other places. So yeah, well, geotextile fabric also is the other thing that I suggest when you're putting it next to lovely big trees and things, line your garden bed with geotextile because, you know, unless you want them to feed off the compost, they will find their way into those sub pods. You just have to look at a good mint population around your sub pod and they're like in there. <laughs> uh, yeah, again, working with these things. So, oh, you worked with Unilever too. Oh, great. So um, what were Paul you doing Pullman. with Unilever? Uh, Paul Pullman actually played um, Paul Pullman, um, former Unilever CEO. Yeah, he came to our uh -huh. workshop. Uh, we, we tried to do some um, workshop to raise awareness regarding sustainability. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. so that was I just, oh, Unilever, I know them. Oh, right. So one straw revolution. Was that was that um oh, that's a um yeah, Japanese um farmer. He um he yeah. wrote a book about it and he talked about the root system. Yeah. All the bacteria and everything. So it's not just um easy, just you pull weeds and looks clean. It's not really 
solving all the problems yeah well the last big um we had a great uh there's a one on the grow hub i had with sandra who's that soil microbiologist and she was the one who was discussing that with me and and it really just made sense that when you've got weeds coming in mm. it's like it's like the natural process the evolution of soil so what it is is that you know nature sends in those pioneers Definitely. that then start to build up the soil microbial bacterial fungal you know populations that starts to create soil so when we pull weeds out or when we pull plants out it's like you're going right back to the beginning again of evolution yeah. so we're trying to like not have to keep the garden and it's particularly in a raised garden bed you know as all of us have probably experienced you know things start to get compacted and the air goes and the and all of that and that's because we keep you know getting soil to go back to the beginning yeah. <laughs> like, oh God, that makes sense now so again i'm learning more about you know how important it is again feeding the soil but making sure that you're not taking things out like air as well uh and structure and all of those things that go into creating um fantastic soil so yeah anyway as you can tell i can rave, rave on about all these things because i just find them so interesting and exciting and thanks for that reminder the one story revolution i when i studied permaculture back in the in the 90s i'm sure this was one of the books that i know was part of the curriculum and and uh yeah uh, I know that's um, another good one. I should get back into having a read of that one again. So great. But yeah, Unilever, they're really trying to do regenerative farming around the world, supporting all of their producers to start caring for the soil. And this is the direction that a lot of businesses and thankfully large companies like what who Jordan works for, Crystal Brook, and those that they are realizing that this is just the way that we have to go, you know. Um, and thankfully, all those targets that they have to meet. Uh, and sustainability practices that are going to become mandatory. So the more that we can help find solutions and the more that we can share uh, it, ways of doing this. Yeah, and I just really value um, our relationship with you guys, Jordan. Thank you so much for allowing us to come and boss you around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, look, I, I always want to want to get better at it. You know, I'm pretty, pretty patient. So like, for, for me, it's kind of, I hope we can do one of these in say six months and the garden's brimming and we've got a bit of a system in place of how that works then, you know? So that's kind of, for me, the end goal. And, and, you know, sometimes it just takes a little longer to get there than, than hoped. But, you know, I think I've said it to you before, the fact that I'm not throwing 120 litres worth of green waste into a bin into landfill a week is for me alone, that's like a huge plus because worked in a lot of kitchens where that's the case so so you know but that, that's a good start but now you know one thing informs the other we would yeah. we wouldn't actually have those garden beds probably if it wasn't for the sub pods because now we need a somewhere to use all of those like you know good Casting, good worm yeah. tracing so yeah unreal. fantastic love that love that and um anytime you need me to come and maybe you know do a presentation to anyone the staff the gardeners you know, happy to do it either via Zoom or to come down in person. We're here to support you guys and whatever you need. Um, and uh, if there's, a, there's no stupid questions. And I'm going to be hassling you for all those spreadsheets with the volumes on it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Always love to report back just how much we're managing to divert. So great. So, so lovely to, to meet you, Rhonda. Thanks for joining us. And um, to Aya, she was saying that she was so lovely to meet us all. Sorry, but she had to go for another meeting. Um, and uh, yeah, look, thanks so much, Jordan. And let me know when you're ready to go to Eden and we'll go shopping and get you some get you some plants in. Always happy yep. to. Well done. All right. All right. Thanks, thank you. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye. Have a great day. See ya. You too. Bye-bye.